Okay. Hi everyone, so my name's uh, Grant McDonald and I'm a postdoc at the moment at the University of Victoria. I'm going to talk a bit about today about estimating sea ice roughness in the Canadian Arctic and also talk a bit about the importance of sea ice more broadly and introduce myself. So I first got interested in the cryosphere when uh, I was a geography student at the University of Edinburgh and I managed to pester my, uh, some PhD students and professor at the department to let me go to Greenland as a field assistant. And I was really lucky to go out to Leverick last year and uh, work as a field assistant for two summers. And uh, here's looking out to Leverick last year, which is next on the west coast of Greenland, next to another famous glacier called um, Russell Glacier. And despite the fact that within two hours of arriving in Greenland, I broke my arm and got sent to Nuuk to get a metal plate put in it um, and have the scars to this day. Obviously, I had such a great time. Uh, despite that, that I wanted to, I came, came back, recovered. I wanted to keep um, studying the cryosphere in Glacier. So after I finished my undergraduate, um, I managed to get a position as a field assistant in Chile for about six months working on high Andes glaciers up in the north of Chile. So this is not like Patagonia. This is um, really high altitude where the glaciers are quite small, but they're really important for water resources. Um, and particularly in this valley where, uh, where these glaciers are, they grow a lot of grapes um, where they make pisco. So big, um, uh, really important for the economy of the area. And I was still uh, loving glaciers after that. So then I did a master's and went on to a PhD um, at, the oops, um, at the University of Chicago, um, where I was really lucky to get to go to Antarctica three times with the US Anta Antarctic program down to McMurdo Station, where I was researching uh, lakes on ice shelves, in interested in how lakes and water on ice shelves around the Antarctic ice sheet and also to some extent in Greenland, how this water forming on the ice can potentially destabilize the ice, causing um, sea level rise and having long-term implications for the whole ice sheet. So that was another great experience. And since then, I've gone on to my uh, postdocs um, where I've shifted my focus a bit further away from the ground um, to, onto sea ice. So just to clarify, um, because the, you may have heard about um, ice shelves at some of these other talks, uh, to distinguish between ice shelf and sea ice, you can see um, on the left image here, we've got the Antarctic ice sheet, which the, the main ice sheet is grounded um, on the continent of Antarctica, and you've got glaciers flowing off that. Ice shelves are floating like sea ice, but they're quite different. Ice shelves are where the glaciers have flown onto the ocean. These can be very thick, hundreds of meters thick, um, many hundreds and can be uh, many years old to th thousands years old and these are um, long-term features whereas sea ice which you've got a bit further away from the ground is it tends to be seasonal um, especially in, in, in the Antarctic it can last for several years but much much of it will, will just come and go as, um, as the seasons come it can be just centimeters thick um, you know uh, for example, on the right, you can see a ship which is just going through through the sea ice, and an icebreaker, you would not be able to do that with an ice shelf. And in the Arctic, you have sea ice on the, on the North Pole, um, uh, above Greenland and around Greenland. So just to make that, make that clear, when I'm talking today, I'll be talking about sea ice from now on, not ice shelves. And why is sea ice important? Well, uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons is albedo. So when, when sea ice melts, uh, leaving the open ocean, or when you get ponds on sea ice through melting, uh, you get these dark areas, the dark uh, water on, on the sea ice or the dark ocean is uh, absorbing a lot more radiation than, than the sea ice itself, which is very bright. It's reflecting the sunlight back by out of the Earth's atmosphere, which has a really important climatic, climatic effects, affects the, the heat budget of the atmosphere which has all sorts of knock-on effects, could cause more glacier melt, global warming, permafrost, fall, and so on. Sea ice is also important uh, for the global climate system through its effects on oceans, particularly in Antarctica, for example, um, the, the formation of the Antarctic um, bottom water 
um, is related to the formation and, and melting of sea ice, and this drives the whole um, global uh, ocean system of currents, which, uh, as we know, is critical for the whole the whole um, Earth's atmosphere. So there's changes happening down Antarctic sea ice really have global effects. Another reason is there's increasing evidence of um, the importance of sea ice in ice shelf stability. So we hear a lot um, in these sessions about the effect Antarctica can have on sea level rise through the ice sheet melting. So sea ice does not directly con contribute to sea level rise, but it can have um, consequences for the stability of the ice, ice sheet. Um, this Im these images here are showing the collapse of the Larsen Bay ice shelf, which was a, a, a catastrophic collapse of, of an ice shelf in the Antarctic Peninsula. And as that um, ice shelf collapsed, the glaciers behind it started flowing more quickly into the ocean. Now, there are many, many um, contributing factors to the collapse of the Larsen Bay ice shelf. Um, but one of those uh, factors appears to have been the, the sea ice adjacent to it, um, breaking up, becoming weaker. And I should also say it's, it, it's sea ice is important for a whole other host of reasons. For example, uh, biological systems, it's key for um, ocean ecosystems, um, down to the microscopic um, life, up to polar bears in the Arctic and penguins in, in, the, in the south. There's been a lot of publicity recently about some emperor penguin colonies that have really suffered from the collapse of um, sea ice down there. And another reason uh, sea ice is um, important is for humans uh, in, in a very direct way. So in the Arctic, um, uh, there, you have, there are Arctic communities, particularly in, in Canada, where sea ice is really a site of, uh, of, of, of much of people's lives there. It's, uh, people travel over the sea ice, um, people hunt on it, people work. It's uh, really important for a whole host of cultural uh, reasons, uh, recreational activities. And as the climate changes, it becomes more unpredictable. So people who've spent their whole lives going out onto the ice almost every day or every weekend, who, who really knew the ice are, are getting caught out because of its unpredictability, because it's changing so fast. And it really is changing fast. So we've seen in, in the Arctic um, really rapid change over, over recent decades. So as of this week, um, Arctic sea ice is at its fifth lowest on record, and it's been declining over decades. Um, so in this summer, it reached um, the sixth lowest minimum extent We've got much less multi-year ice than, than we did in the past. So uh, a lot of the ice would survive multiple years and get thicker. Uh, so much of that, of that ice is gone. We're being really left with first year ice. So just ice that comes and goes from year to year, which is thinner, less stable. And we're also now seeing changes um, uh, down in the Antarctic, really stark changes. So until just a few years ago, the Antar Antarctic sea ice was considered relatively stable, or even might have been increasing. But in recent years, we've seen a, a, a quite a sharp decline. And particularly this year, 2023 has been a record break in year for Antarctic sea ice. Um, you can, if you look at this graph here, you can see how, how it's been in recent, recent years. And 2022 was a, was, a pretty, was a low year. And then that blue line underneath is this year up till just last week. You can see the extent is, is really dramatically low. And it seems like Antarctic sea ice might have uh, reached a, a new kind of um, state. And there's a lot of research going into that right now. Now, I'll, I'll be talking particularly about sea ice roughness um, today, which is uh, related to all these issues. And as I mentioned before, ice is very important for people in the Arctic. So sea ice, rough sea ice, I'll just put it back. So as you get rough ice in areas that people are regularly traveling over, it can be a real challenge and dangerous. So it, it, at the lower end of the scale, it can be damaging to, to snowmobiles, but that can be costly. It, can, it makes travel really inefficient. You have to travel around rough ice or you travel through it and you risk um, damaging your vehicle or it can it can be dangerous if you're traveling at speed and you come across some unexpected rough ice then that's uh, you could crash and it really cause um, some damage and sea ice roughness is also important for a, a host of uh, geophysical reasons uh, and uh, 
scientific reasons. Um, so, for example, uh, a lot of our knowledge of, of the Arctic and Antarctica comes from uh, Earth system models, uh, ocean models, sea ice models. And uh, to, to really uh, model the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean, where you've got ice in between, knowing roughness and how, and how uh, momentum uh, transfers from the atmosphere to the ocean, we want to have a good idea of the roughness affects the drag um, of, of ice. Sea ice roughness is, is also important to know um, for uh, altimetry retrievals. So altimetry measurements provide really important information about the poles. They give us the, they tell us the height of ice and form the basis of a, a, a lot of new measurements. And we also want to know roughness because it, it plays a role in determining how melt, melt ponds form over the summer. So melt ponds are really important for that albedo effect I mentioned and the, uh, they'll form in depressions on the ice, which is related to roughness. But unfortunately, so far, sea ice roughness information is really lacking uh, for, for the community and for scientists. We've, in recent years, we've had the launch of ISAT2, which gives us really good roughness information. ISAT2 is, a, is an altimetry satellite from NASA, which is going around the Earth giving us 90-day repeats of a particular area and giving us really precise to the centimeter level measurements of, of height and from that we can get roughness but these measurements are over very thin thin tracks you don't get them over a, a very um, you don't get them over kilometers width and they're also like i said 90-day repeat so it's really good information but it's temporally and spatially quite limited we and we also get we can get some good height and roughness information from radar altimetry too, but that's um, at a relatively low resolution and still locking in some ways. So it'd be really great if we could get more um, sea ice roughness information from SAR. So SAR is, is a satellite radar system, which has really been grown in recent years. The most famous one probably is Sentinel-1, which is a European Space Agency satellite. We also have the RadarSat Constellation mission or RadarSat-2, which are Canadian space agencies, agency satellites. And we have uh, ALOS, which is of Pal Pulsar, which is from the Japanese space agency. And just next year, we'll have NISAR, which is a NASA-India collaboration, which will be giving us really valuable SAR information. So we've got this really these really rich SAR data sets, these really rich radar satellite imagery data sets coming through. Um, which will allow us, give us images of, of the Earth, but a bit more information than, than regular optical images. They, for one, they can see through clouds, and they can see through the polar night, which of course is a huge challenge for researching the poles. And they also give us a bit more information because it's, it's not simply an optical image, it's a, it's a radar image which is interacting with the surface depending on, on uh, different features of the surface. And at the same time, we recently had ISAT2, as I mentioned. So we can link this, this uh, rich data set of SAR imagery with these new advances of ISAT2. That would really give us new opportunities for understanding roughness. So here's an example of, of SAR. So um, a SAR satellite, you have satellite um, Sentinel-1 going along, giving us these images. You get these grayscale, grayscale um, satellite SAR images. So this is an area in the Canadian Arctic, and they can be useful just to look at, um, but if we can actually get quantitative data of roughness from every pixel of that image, that would really help uh, both scientists out for analyzing uh, roughness and communities who want this information. So what I've been doing is, is looking at a site in the Canadian Arctic, uh, Canadian Arctic archipelago, where we've got stable land fast ice, so ice, sea ice that doesn't move, um, for, for months at a time. We have ice sat tracks going over the same area. And um, what I'm doing is comparing the roughness information you get from this altimetry data, which is measuring very precise roughness along these thin tracks, and then comparing that data with the SAR pixels, the radar pixels, to then try to develop a model to be able to take a whole image and get roughness for the whole image. In addition to that, we've been doing field work. So the oops. 
So here is uh, me and a colleague up in the Canadian Arctic, an area called Pond Inlet. We're um, trying to measure the snow surface because um, if we want to understand SAR imagery, we also need to understand how it's actually penetrating through the snow to better understand it. Here we are on the left in a, in a Kamatuk, which is on some nice, quite smooth first year ice um, in, in Pond Inlet. So you can see that that kind of journey will be relatively uh, smooth, although not as smooth as you might imagine when you're sitting on the back of a Kamatuk uh, behind a fast snowmobile. But as you get further away from there, we'll come across some quite rough ice. And we're also really trying to not just analyze the data, but really try to understand what is happening with the SAR signal. Why is the SAR signal uh, interacting with roughness in this way? And for example, we, we find that um, as, a, as a horizontal radar image comes in, it, you get bounces uh, off rough features. Um, and the more it bounces, it comes back in, in a different way in what we call ver vertical polarization. Um, which gives us a higher, higher backscatter, a brighter image where there is rough sea ice. And I won't, won't go into it, but incidentally, we also find that uh, on older ice, these SAR images are, are also uh, have a strong relationship with multi-year ice height. So the, the techniques we're looking at for roughness might also be useful for estimating sea ice height. And from height, we can then make estimates of thickness, which is, of course, really important for understanding changes in the Arctic and Antarctic. And to show an example of, of, of what we've achieved so far, so if uh, this is a roughness along a track in the Canadian Arctic, and from the yellow, uh, sorry, the blue line shows roughness measured by this laser altimetry, so we know that's uh, a reliable data set of roughness, and then we have roughness estimated from a SAR radar image along the same track. And we can see that it captures the roughness quite well. You can see key changes. Uh, for example, if you look at the spike at around 200 um, kilometers, the, the um, SAR image tracks the, what we get from ISAT too. So we have really promising data for being able to estimate roughness from, from SAR images. And one of the things we're working to do with that, as well as analyze the geophysics of it, is to produce community-relevant roughness maps. Um, so for people in Arctic communities, such as Pond Inlet in, in the north of Baffin Island, people who are going out on the ice uh, will be able to print out a map of roughness, identify which, uh, which, which route they would want to take, which is efficient, which is fast, which is safe, which where they're not likely going to to uh, damage their snowmobiles and get hurt. And we're, we're working with people in that community. One of the PIs on our project is from that community to really know what is what is useful for these uh, for these communities. What what do they want from from these roughness maps? Um, so what levels of roughness um, are important for a snowmobile, for example? And working with the communities um, and sharing what we're learning together from the ground and what we're learning from satellite imagery so that they can produce their own roughness maps. And also just mention quickly on the side that slush is another big issue that we're uh, working to, uh, on, on this project with too. So j I'll just read out the words from one of our P PIs. So Andrew Ariak um, is, a, is a PI with the Smart Ice Project, which is a Canadian NGO, which is one of the leaders of this project, along with uh, UCL and ourselves. So he says, helping to keep my community safe when they travel on the ice is very important to me. And I'm very proud that my community trusts me to provide the smart ice monitoring and mapping service for them. They've been noticing that the ice is changing and becoming less predictable with more rough ice and more slush. The Sukutiak project will generate more ice mapping tools and information that me and my smart ice colleagues can use to help our communities manage these added travel risks. And I'll just point out, um, so Kutiak means good ice in the language in, in, in the Canadian Arctic. So what we have to do next, so we we have these kind of preliminary um, roughness models and maps, which are, are useful, but we really need to, to do more to better understand the relationship between SAR and roughness on the ground. We need, to, we need to do more analysis of remote sensing imagery. We need to do more field work. There's really a relatively um, un unstudied field um, 
and a lot of these SAR instruments are new. We need to look at different kinds of SAR and look at how it varies with different ice types. We, uh, it could vary with age of ice, the snow cover, and so on. And yeah, also look at other ways to utilize SAR. So I mentioned that SAR might also be useful to, uh, for example, estimate changes in height and thickness. So there's a lot of potential for SAR. We're really excited to what it can do to both better understand the geophysics and changing climate in the Arctic and Antarctic, and also to support communities who spend their lives there. Thank you. Yeah, if you've got any questions, please send us an email at grandmacall.uvic.com. Thank you.